this week. Normally I'm tickling the ivories, but um, every once in a while we like to pick up the old axe. <laughs> and because I had this uh, song request, a new name and glory, thanks to D, you know Dion, you know that. So we went with the maroon books, right? 345, 345. What did I say? Capo 2, correct? You guys good? And we got Anthony actually with the bass too, so if he blows you guys away, I'm sorry. earlier. Would you break? Better? I don't hear it. The Lord's like, I don't like bass. Yeah. He doesn't like thunder, uh, wasn't my idea. Yeah. Whatever. You're like, oh, it sounded so good. Yeah. Man, you're like a politician. Didn't say I didn't like it. <laughs> Woo! Right. Something ain't right. right Are we good? Turn that yeah. down, though. Don't hurt people. Oh, my Good? All right, there we go. <laughs> I was once a sinner, but I came hiding to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, and the white road angels sing their story, a sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, with my sins forgiven I am bound for heaven. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not for God's angry frown. When the heavens opened and I saw that my name was written down, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. And the white robed angels sing this story A sinner has come home For there's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine With my sins forgiven I am bound for heaven Never more to roam In the book tis written Saved by grace, oh the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am made whole. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. And the white robed angels sing their story, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. You guys sound like you mean it. 339, same hymn book, 339. Heaven came down. 
Great song. We don't do this very often, do we? Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace, he did proper, he saved me, oh, praise is their name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now of a hope that will surely endure, after the passing of time I have a future in heaven for sure There in those mansions sublime And it's because of that wonderful day When at the cross I believe Riches eternal and blessings supernal From His precious hand I receive Heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole My sins were washed away And my night was turned to day Heaven came down and glory filled my soul And 474 Anthony, turn that down just a hair for me, please Anthony, just a smidge, turn it yeah. down. 474. <clears throat> There's a piece in my heart that the world never gave a peace it cannot take away though the trials of life may surround like a cloud I've a peace that has come there to stay Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave. Mine. All the world seems to sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art! 
constantly abiding. Jesus is mine, constantly abiding. Rapture divine, He never leaves me lonely. Whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. This treasure I have in a temple of clay. While here on his footstool I roll. But he's coming to take me some glorious day over there to my heavenly home constantly abiding Jesus is mine constantly abiding rapture divine he I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. And 429. We'll end with this song, 429. Lest we forget, you can't earn your salvation by holiness, but... God does want you to live like you're his child after you get saved. So he expects a little more out of us than he does out of that world. Big time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Big friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing His blessings to see. time in secret with Jesus alone by looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be thy friends in thy conduct is likeness shall see take time to
All right, why don't we turn over to the book of Proverbs. As always, if I didn't get a chance to say good morning, this is me doing that now. Proverbs chapter 7. All right, two weeks ago, we introduced this woman that the Bible refers to as a strange woman, and we talked about what she represents. Religion, idolatry, false worship, maybe even a sense of false security. Um, and then we noted that she has lips as in honeycomb, the Bible says, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Now we're talking, she's a sweet-talking woman. But when she opens her mouth, of what does she speak? So with all that now, we're going to revisit this woman because the chapter revisits her. In fact, you're going to find her a few times in the book of Proverbs. So I'm assuming then that she must be important. Not in a good way. She's important enough to take note of and to announce a warning of. Uh, so let's get a little bit more of her character. And I, I know it's not the kind of message, especially after someone gets saved and we're singing those songs and we're all happy, then we've got to do this. But, you know, it is what it is. We're working in order here. But we're going to get the character, her heart, of this strange woman. We're going to move on to her speech, which is a reflection of her, of her heart. And then we're going to conclude with, well, who does she affect the most? Okay? So, Father, uh, we would pray now, as always, Holy Spirit of God, that you, would, uh, that you would guide my speech, guide us all in our hearts through the text of Scripture. Teach us something this morning, Lord, that... Um, Maybe we didn't know before. Uh, teach us something that we can find a way to apply to our lives. And uh, oh, oh, let me just say this, Lord, thank you uh, for the testimony of Dion's salvation. Uh, we give you praise. We can go home rejoicing over that uh, and, and for days, weeks to come. So we thank you. And, and I know that uh, according to Scripture, the angels... We're also rejoicing in that moment. So thank you that you're still saving souls. You're still working in the lives of people. And I pray that if there's anyone else out there, Lord, maybe hasn't made that decision, that you would impress, maybe even through Dion's testimony, the importance of this. And maybe just encourage them, Lord, that we don't make a huge spectacle out of it so that they would be embarrassed. But we're also, we don't want to encourage not being we don't want to encourage being ashamed of the gospel. So we announce that for what the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So again, thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our propitiation, for dying for our sins on that cross. And we now ask your spirit to guide us through the text of Scripture in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Proverbs 7. We're, we're going to look at verses 10 through 18, and then we'll kind of jump back up to... Uh, um, conclude the message. So in verse 10 we read, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. So there met him. Him who? Well, we'll see at the end of the message. That's why I want you to stay tuned. All right, verse 11 and 12. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So a couple things about her that we already did learn from a couple weeks ago um, that the Lord is now just kind of bringing back to light. Number one, her, her feet abide not in her house, or as was mentioned in the fifth chapter, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Proverbs 5, 6. Notice, by the way, she has ways, plural, and they move. They change according to the need of the hour. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This woman has ways, plural. All roads lead to God, 
right? They don't, but that's what she would tell you. So again, now the historical application, this is aimed at the woman of the oldest profession on earth, right? We're, we can't forget that, that that is historically what this is. But doctrinally, she's so much more. She is Mystery Babylon of Revelation 17, 5. She's the wicked woman in the ephah, Zechariah 5 and verse 8. She is religious idolatry personified. Of her it is said in Proverbs 5 and verse 4, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. So note all the fives associated with this woman throughout Scripture because death is associated with her and number five in Scripture is associated with death. You'll get the law first mentioned, just go Genesis 5, and you'll see, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. So 5 is the number for death. It is not the number for grace that I read in Scripture. I don't know where people get that. Um, but this woman, she's got a connection to number 5 because her feet go down to death. She moves around so that not to be detected or be recognized for who she is. These are things that we discussed a couple of weeks ago. She comes in many forms through many man-made religions and maybe satanically driven uh, religions. Uh, she takes hold on hell and all those that are willing to follow this woman. They don't even realize they're following a woman. They think they're following a faith, a religion, like any other one else, just like you Christians. We're just following our own paths, our way. Number two, she is without now in the streets. If you remember back to a couple weeks ago, what did I reference? I, I, we talked about how the Christians we're out on a street corner when the weather's nicer. You know, this is Buffalo. We're on a street corners with gospel signs, gospel tracts, do a little bit of preaching. And, and I mentioned that this woman, she's so prevalent out in that world that the moment we go there with the gospel, she's going to go with another gospel. You know, when we preach out to the people, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, along comes a car that pulls up with a woman with a bullhorn yelling at us. We've seen that. Is that the strange woman? No, that is the effects of the strange woman in the lives of humanity. This voice of resistance to the truth of the gospel. Now, how many, just think about this, how many street corners do you find street preachers on these days? Very rare. How many corners is she on according to verse 12? Every corner. What does that mean? That means that she is more diligent to deceive than Christians are to bear witness of the truth. That's just the truth. Number three, she's subtle of heart. You see that in verse 10. If she's subtle of heart, then she speaks out of that subtlety. So who does she speak like? Who's the most subtle beast of the field? Satan. So she speaks in that manner. Her father is the devil. She speaks as her, as, as her father. And, and what is that? Well, it's a serpent. That's a forked tongue. That's why she's got multiple ways. Who are you? Oh, okay, so I'll speak this way to you. Who are you? Oh, okay, I'll speak this way to you. Double speech. Political speech. Number four... Something we didn't mention two weeks ago. She's loud and stubborn. <laughs> the fact that she's loud really probably shouldn't come as a surprise because she has a voice in every country. She has a voice in every province, every state, every township. She's got a voice in most churches. She's got a, a voice in most homes. She's prevalent. She's loud. But the fact that she's stubborn should tell you a little bit about the nature that she passes down to those that follow her. This is a, a spiritual state of pride and implacability. What do you mean by that? Sir, can I tell you about Jesus? I have my own religion. Where'd that come from? Stubborn pride. I didn't ask you if you had a religion. I asked if we could talk about Jesus. Where did that response come from? Ma'am, can I offer you a gospel track? Well, I just don't see why you should be pushing that in our faces. 
This woman can't be reasoned with. Even when you point out the hypocrisies of said faiths of others, it really doesn't matter because facts, in my experience, they mean nothing to a couple of different people, the religious and the liberal. Facts mean nothing. So that's what she's like, but let's now get her message. We've got her heart. We see what her character is like. We talked about a number of these things, but now let's get what comes out of her mouth. Ready? Verse 13. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, impudent, that's shamelessly immodest. In other words, she doesn't blush at her ungodly rebellion. Couldn't care less. You could preach at her all day long. She laughs at you. And she kissed him, just kind of like Judas. She's got a Judas kiss. Verse 14, here's what she says unto him. I have peace offerings with me. This day I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face. I have found, and I have found thee. So what is she saying? What is this woman? This woman's on a corner, and she's preaching. She's preaching. She's doing to other people what this church, in its rare form, does on that street corner. Calls to people and preaches. But what is she saying? She's saying, I have performed my sacraments. I've paid my vows. I've done my penance. I have good works. That is the voice of religion. Peace offerings, payments, vows. Doesn't matter that she prostituted herself on every corner. She went to the priest. He said, well, just say ten our fathers and three Hail Marys. You're all good. Oh, I paid my vows. I did my penance. What is she teaching this man? She's teaching him that offerings and good works clear up sin. She's in a completely sinful lifestyle and she says, it's okay. I did my vows. That's religion. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the complete opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let me take the opportunity then to show you. Go to 2 Timothy, chapter 1. 2 Timothy. Because why reference the gospel and not share it? We do a lot, in this church, we do a lot of warning of what's to come. And maybe can be a little off-putting to some people, but, oh, church, so needful. So needful for us to make sure that we are ready for whatever comes, spiritually speaking, upon us. And um, there's a lot of lying going on out there. And a lot of trouble probably coming, so we need, we need to be prepared. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 let me encourage you with this verse. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So it doesn't really matter what's coming in the sense, should be aware, but don't be afraid. Devil's got nothing on the Lord. And it may be the, you know, like uh, Jesus said to Judas, now is the power, it's the devil's time, the power of darkness. Okay, but who's going to win? Jesus wins. So be hopeful. Don't be fear. Live life in power. Live life with love. Be sound of mind. And for that, you need to be here. Verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was charged to us, what does it say? Given, given us in Christ Jesus, so without Christ there's no gift, he is the gift, before the world began, but now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, 
and hath brought life and immortality to light through, there it is again, the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. You're close by, look at Titus chapter 3. Twice over, there's the gospel mentioned. And in accordance with the gospel, it says not according to our works, but according to his grace. Jesus Christ died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. He was buried. He rose again three days and three nights later. This is the gospel. You can be saved from death by putting your trust in that gospel. And it's, and it's an act of love. It's an act of mercy. It's an act of grace. But you won't earn it. He doesn't say, hey, let me give you the gift if you say, you know, one Our Father and three Hail Marys. What is that nonsense? That's religion. That's religion. Uh, Titus 3 and verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, there's the new birth, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's an action done by the Spirit of God when your will lines up with what He offered you. And then you get regenerated. What is that? Born again. Jesus said, ye must be born again. So you preach that a lot around here. Yep. And if I don't, the one day someone shows up who isn't saved here, right? What would you rather hear? The tithe? <laughs> you won't hear that either. So religion preaches, do for God. That God may possibly, hopefully, with enough doing, accept you. That's religion. Every religion, and you know it's true. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, God saves. Maybe. And just in case, you know, when you die, just have the family give some money. In case they missed anything. <laughs> but the gospel preaches, God did for you what you could never do for you, which you must trust in in order to be saved. It is literally the complete opposite of what all religion teaches and preaches, what this woman teaches and preaches on every corner, in every city, in every country. And leads millions to hell. The gospel is not works. The gospel is grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I was sharing that with uh, Dion on Saturday. Listen, nobody can stand up in front of God and go, I've paid my vows. That's what she's saying. I'm good. She's like, wait a minute. Uh, can I just say this? She's a whore. And she goes, but no, I'm good. I paid my vows. Well, you know what you were before you got saved? You were a whore. A spiritual one. Don't think you're going to walk into God's house with your whoredom and go, yeah, but God, I put, I put some money into those coffers. I paid my vows. I did the, our fathers. I counted the beads. I lit some candles. I did, I did my religion. I don't want your religion. I wanted your heart. So don't listen to this religion woman. She, she's a liar. Uh, she's, she's subtle. Uh, and God will not accept your penance, your offerings, your vows, your good works to get you into heaven. The only sacrifice ever acceptable to him is the one that his son made on your behalf, uh, not this particular cross, but on the cross. Place your trust in the cross of Christ. Repent of your religion. Get rid of the religion. Back to Proverbs. Oh. 
Folks, the way this country is going, this may be the last message I ever preach. I feel that way almost every week. And that feeling ain't going anywhere. Now, it hasn't been true yet, but... So I better make sure that if I feel like this could be my last, that the gospel's going to be there. Verse 16, she's going to keep preaching. And what does she say? She says, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works. <laughs> you getting it? With fine linen of Egypt. Egypt being a type of? The world. So what else is she saying? What else is she, what is she preaching? Number two, I am beautiful. I am ornamental. If your, as, a, as human beings, incessant need to prove yourself to God through your apparent good works and vows won't motivate you enough to follow this woman, her beauty just may. She's outwardly attractive. She's ornate. She's beautiful. A lot of money is invested into making sure she's all dolled up. Carved works of wood and stone. The golden thread of the world. She's got the world's riches. What does she look like? She looks like the Taj Mahal in India. It's beautiful. Beautiful works of art. She's the temple of heaven in China. She's the white temple of Thailand. Let's bring it home. She's the basilica in Lackawanna. That's religion. You ever been in that place? I, one, time, I, one time in my life I had the misfortune of stepping in the, that building. <laughs> and it was to hear the Handel's Messiah. And I'm thinking, look at the song that I'm listening to with that idol and that image and that idol and that image. And, that, and I'm thinking, this is, I don't care how beautiful the world thinks it is, I'm going to vomit. It's ugly to me. It's disgusting to me. And it, according to scripture, it is to God as well. So, but the average person goes, oh, I'm in a holy place. It must be. Look at its beauty. Look at how much money went into this. You know, Jesus told us, though, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. If you want, I can walk you through this building, and I can show you all the nicks in the floors, and we can show you the baseboard and how they fall apart, and you'll hear, the, you'll hear them, tick, 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 pop, 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 And, you know, and we try to take care of it because God has blessed us with a building, and we try to keep it up. And praise the Lord for it. We're in a nice warm place, free from the law. <laughs> but what's wrapped up in the plaster and the wood and the lights and all this stuff, really, it doesn't mean a whole lot. This church has been built from the very beginning on this foundation, not this foundation. So judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You may walk into a shack. I'm telling you right now that even... So we, I'm saying, don't look at the Taj Mahal and go beautiful, or the Basilica and go beautiful. You could walk in here and have beauty here. But I'm going to tell you something even further. You walk into a shack in China, or a cave where they're hiding. And I think it's even more beautiful than what we have here. And I think God sees it that way. So don't take for granted what you have, because we may not have it for long. But don't put your stock in the stuff. We don't want to end up admiring this woman the way the Apostle John did in Revelation. Remember, he admired her. Why? She's good looking. She looks good. Money and beauty will always attract the people of Egypt. The wealth of Egypt attracts the people of Egypt. We must dig a little deeper. There's more than the gold plating. Let me show you Matthew chapter 23. 
Let's see what Jesus said here. Verse 27. One of his rants against the Pharisees. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's, geez, that's God calling people names. Is he lying? So then it must not be wrong to call names because he didn't sin. It was truth. He was calling them out. And he said, For ye are like unto whited sepulchers. They were stained sepulchers, made beautiful on the outside, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Ooh, the basilica. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. The Lord's going... Do you not see the rottenness, the stink of the carcasses within this place? Look beyond the stone and the carving and the beauty and the gold of Egypt and get to the heart of what this woman is saying. So the Pharisees embodied the legalism of religion and that was works to be right with God but proved that they were not right with God because of what lied within their hearts. And Jesus called them out on it. That's the Jesus that will save you. That's the same Jesus that died on the cross. Okay? Hear that. Same Jesus that died on the cross and says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That same Jesus, if you will not heed that call, will go, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're full of dead men's bones. I don't care what religion you're a part of. You're dead. Same Jesus. Right? Well, everyone thinks of the kumbaya, Jesus like he's a guitar-strumming hippie. Tougher than anyone in here, I guarantee you. Uh, okay, verse, let's go back to Proverbs. Verse 17. We'll get the last point of this. She's got a three-point message. <laughs> she says in verse 17, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. I love cinnamon. Anyone here else? Anyone else love cinnamon? Cinnamon's like the best spice love the smell of it. I love the taste of it. You could put it on just about anything. Right? I'm sold. Sold. I actually have a cologne that's cinnamon scented. <laughs> so what else is she saying? What is she preaching? What does this mean? Quite honestly, if you get to the heart of it, she says, I have seductive influence. I can lure you into my bed. And it's a spiritual seduction. Because again, this isn't literal fornication. This is spiritual fornication. There is a spiritual seductress in that world. She brings Egypt with her. She brings beauty with her. And she's saying, listen, okay, if I don't look good, and if my house doesn't look good, Maybe my bed will look good. And the average guy goes, Whoa! Oh. Because that's dudes. I can influence you. She says, I'm everywhere, but you don't know where because my ways are movable. She says, I'll say anything except the truth. And I'll do anything as long as it feels good. That's her message. How does my bed look now? Smells good? 
cinnamon. Mm. Comfortable enough for you? You know what this is? What she's doing here, it is a constant breakdown, beat down of the human will. And you're seeing it. You're seeing it in a different sense. You're seeing it politically. But you're seeing this just... I don't, am I the only one that feels that even Christians are just like, I'm done. I, I'm done. I can't, I can't keep doing this. Pastor preaches this. And then this happens. And this happens. I'm just, I'm done. I can't. Can't hear it anymore. Can't listen to it anymore. Folks, I'd love the rapture to be tonight. It might not be for 10 years. I don't know. You don't know. I wish. I was excited for this past year. I was wrong. <laughs> but just this constant breakdown. I want to show you. Here's the type. Go to, go to Genesis chapter 39. Let me show you this. Don't quit. Listen, we're supposed to be the Lord's army. You're supposed to be soldiers. You got soldiers in the capital right now camping out and they don't even know what they're doing there. What are our soldiers doing? They're just camping out in their own beds. <laughs> Christian, wake up! Um, it's snooze again. Did you see that, Christian? Come on, ding, 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 ding. Snooze. No, didn't you get this? Snooze, snooze, snooze. I'm better just sleeping. In whose bed? Genesis 39, watch this. You know the story of Joseph in Egypt? Right? Where's this woman's tapestry from? She's from Egypt. Watch this. For, uh, well, we can start. We'll start in verse 10. We'll start in verse 1. And we've got time. And we'll read down to verse 10. Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, of the, of an, or guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So, uh, by the way, just, just saying, before there were slaves in America, there were slaves in Egypt. Slavery's been forever, and it still goes on. They're just doing it politically now. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in, the, in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessings of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And Joseph's a type of Christ, but he could also be a type of the Christian. Listen, Egypt is better. The world is better when someone associated with God is in it. He will make the house better. Okay? Verse 6, but he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not that... Uh, knew not Aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. Joseph was a goodly person, well favored. That means he, he so trusted Joseph, he, I don't even know what I have. It's kind of like my wife. I have no idea what's in my bank account. No clue. Here's a paycheck, honey. Do with it what, you know, she could be. I'm not all that rich, so. She, but she might have an offshore account somewhere. I have no idea. Ready to retire in Arkansas or something. <laughs> Can't retire in the Bahamas, but you can maybe in Arkansas. Uh, verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. What's the strange woman in Proverbs 7 doing? Same thing. Same thing. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, 
that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. What's she doing? Every single day, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. Just a beat down of man's will. And again, the picture's clear. There's no greater attack on a man's will than a woman. That's just the reality. That's how it is. It's just this. Now, he overcame, praise the Lord. But do we? And does the average man out in that world, does he overcome the lure? The constant, constant, in your face. Believe this way. Think this way. Act this way. Believe this. Do this. Eat this. Sleep here. Lie here. Everything. And they start when you're in school. Stand in line. Stand in line. And the moment you step out of line, what are you doing? Get in line. Get in line. What is that? So, well, that's just law and order. Yeah, that's a little more. That's a little more. Back up to verse 15 of Proverbs. Go back. When it comes right down to it, folks, the human will is it's very strong, and it, can be, and it can be strong for good, and it can be strong for evil. But the human will can also be broken. Just enough whipping, like a horse. You break a horse. What do you do to a horse? You break its will so that you can control it. What are they doing? Breaking your will so they can control you. And that's political and religious. It's both. Proverbs 7, 15. She says, Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligent to seek thy face, and I have found thee. All pronouns in the scripture in your King James Bible that begin with a T are singular. If they begin with a Y, they are meant to be plural. I say unto thee, ye must be born again. But here, this woman saying, I'm come forth to meet thee, to diligent seek thy face, and I have found thee. This is a personal attack and a vexation of one's personal spirit and personal soul. Diligent. She came with diligence, pressed daily like the woman against Joseph. Every day, day by day by day by day, I'm, I've come for thee. So religion comes in many forms because people come in many forms. So she has to create something for you. Your truth. Well, that's your truth. And that's acceptable language today. And in fact, if I say, no, there's either truth or there's a lack of truth, they look at you and go, like you're crazy. It's like, well, how can 2 plus 2 equal 7 for you? That's an untruth. It's 4. See, but these are spiritual things, so there aren't spiritual truths. Well, that's where you're mistaken. But she understands that you have a will and that you have a personality and that you like to be dandled upon her knees. Forget the truth. Doesn't matter to the religious. She wants to know, how does it feel to you? How does it feel to you? How does it feel to you? Doesn't matter, you know, forget everyone else. You, you and me. How does it feel? Feels good, right? You like this, right? That's religion. That's religion. Ah, I found my truth. Verse 18. Come, let us take our fill of love. Ah, yeah, it's love. It's not lust. It's love. What is love scripturally? Sacrifice. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved you, he sacrificed his son. That's love. I don't care what the world tells you. The world tells you this. Hey, let's go to bed together. That's love. Wrong. That's lust. And we'll fill ourselves with love till the morning, right? Because I know you don't want to see me beyond the morning. No commitment. No commitment required. Let us solace ourselves with loves. As if there's multiple forms of it. So this is carnal. It's based upon feeling and emotion. And it's all about why don't we find a religion that brings us solace. Comfort to our depression. Happiness to our sorrow. Prize to our misfortune. That's religion. And so as we began the message, we now need to end. Who will fall for the invitation and influence of the strange woman. What sort of a person will fall for all of this preaching, for lack of better terminology? Well, now for that, you need to back up to the sixth verse. For at the window of my house I looked through a casement and beheld among the simple ones... I discerned among the youths, the young man void of understanding. Passing through the street corner near her corner, or the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark of night. Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. And behold, there met him a woman with the entire of an harlot and subtle of heart. And that's where we began was with verse 10. But I wanted to back you up to say, who's going to fall for this? She's on the corner. She's beckoning into the home. She's luring into the bed. Those void of understanding. And in this day and age, that's pretty much everyone. Why? Last place, Psalm 119. Psalm 119. In verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. What is she? A false way. How do I know? Through the precepts of God. Now I understand. Well, who falls victim? The ones that don't search the scriptures. The ones that are just so void of any spiritual understanding that as long as she looks good and feels good, I think you ought to be able to just choose that and, you know, no harm, no foul. Void of understanding. Anyone that does not know the scripture is susceptible to the words of this strange woman. And do greatly err according to Jesus. You don't know the scripture, you, you can not just err, greatly err. How much so? Oh, you'll follow her into hell. That's how great. And that's pretty great. We're talking eternally great. So, as always, <laughs> it's back to the Bible. How do you escape that in the Scripture? You can't. Everything comes back to making sure you're so grounded in the Word of God that you're not deceived by those things that co go contrary to the Word of God. And pretty much everything out there, anything that's on the television is contrary to this. Anything that's in print now is contrary to this. Anything that people are preaching now, any religion is contrary to this. So what do I do with everything that's contrary? Well, I get rid of that which is contrary and I follow the word of God and I get some understanding of what's going on in these last days. So now, next week, Lord willing, we'll see. Another woman shows up. 
in the 8th chapter. She will also preach. And it will be contrary to the voice of the strange woman. Who is this woman? Well, we'll see if we can't figure out who she may possibly represent. And uh, that will be next week. So stay tuned. All right, we good? Ready to go home? I'm ready to eat. I'm hungry. We ate this. Maybe fill up the, the belly as well. Uh, Father, thank you so much uh, for what you've shown us here. As always, thy word is truth. And we need it. A lot of, not even just save people who are all the way around the world, but save people included, just so ignorant of what the Bible says. We're void of understanding and we fall for every lure of the strange woman. And we don't even see it when it enters into our own church houses because we're ignorant of the word. I thank you, Lord. There are a number of people in this, in this assembly that followed your precepts and they had understanding and they heard the voice of a strange woman calling in the streets and they rejected that call. I thank you for the wisdom that, that, is, in this, that is in this assembly. And I pray it would continue as such. I pray it would only get stronger. I pray that we'd wake up spiritually, get our heads out of the sand, and understand what's going on in these last days. And help us, Lord, to live righteously and to have a great testimony about us. Lord, help us to be diligent about sharing that gospel with those who need it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.